Good morning, everybody. I hope that you're doing well. A blessed third week of Advent. I'm sure that all of you are getting excited and ready for uh, for Christmas celebration shortly. I hope that you're having a chance to take some time off and spend some time with, with loved ones and that you're staying safe. For this week, uh, we're going to be looking at the Gospel reading in John 1, which focuses on John the Baptist. So let me set it up this way. I remember as a kid, I remember staying up really late sometimes uh, at night, and I also remember um, watching TV sometimes on a Saturday morning, and they had infomercials. So this is long before, um, long before streaming services or YouTube or Netflix, where you basically could watch anything that you want at any time. Sometimes you just had to watch what was on. And so you'd have these infomercials that would uh, basically be pitching some sort of miracle product. It was going to change your life in some way. And one of the types of infomercials that I would see is cleaning products, miracle cleaning products. In fact, uh, all these miracle cleaning products would change your life in some way. The commercials would often start with something with like, are you afraid of or are you tired of? And then usually there'd be some sort of black and white video of people screwing something up with the, usually it was the simplest of tasks. They couldn't tie something right or the hose would spray out of their hand. Um, it just, you wonder who these people are that they can't do the simplest of tasks. So they have the black and white, um, black and white video, and then there would be some sort of flashing star or flashing light and everything would be color again. And you'd have this big reveal of this product that was going to change your life. And then it switches. And then you see, uh, for cleaning products, it would be something like a duster that could reach strange places and absorbs 90% more dust particles or uh, a potion that removes dirt and covers cracks on your car surface or a swirl and twirl mop that can make cleaning your floors much easier and, I guess according to the commercial, somehow fun. Um, a long stick that can finally help you get those annoying gutters clear from leaves. A new lotion that takes years of, of wrinkles off of your skin. All of these amazing products to help us clean. Now instinctively, as human as humans, we know that being clean is better than being dirty. I have not heard a formal debate where one person is arguing that being dirty is superior. We have a phrase in our culture called a clean freak or a neat freak. People who seem to need everything straightened up, put in place, vacuumed, and perfectly spotless. They seem to spend way too much time cleaning. Maybe you know somebody like that. They're so annoying. But we all know that being clean is being better than being dirty. From a wider cultural perspective, some cultures value cleanliness more than others. The ancient Jewish people could be considered clean freaks as a culture. In the Law of Moses, there were all kinds of regulations regarding what was clean or unclean. Certain foods were unclean. Certain mixes of fabrics were unclean. Certain places were unclean. Certain acts made you unclean. For instance, if you were a woman who was having her monthly cycle and were bleeding, that made you unclean. The law outlined specific ways that people could become clean if they were considered unclean. When the high priest visited the inner part of the temple on, for his yearly uh, visit to the inner part, he had to be completely clean or else he was in imminent danger. This was all part of the ceremonial aspects of the Jewish law given to God's people by God himself, by his direct command. People who were ceremonially unclean for whatever reason would want to become clean again. This would give them access to the religious and social and cultural as aspects of their local community. I bring this up because in the context of our gospel reading in John 1, some priests and Levites approach John the Baptist to find out what's going on with John the Baptist, this guy in the, in the, world, in the wilderness who's uh, baptizing people and preaching a new message. When John denies being the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, they say, then why are you baptizing? And that was the part of the text that jumped out at me. Why are you baptizing? What we see here is that the word baptize or baptism already meant something to the people, the Jewish people at the time. Why are you baptizing? In other words, why are you doing this practice that we're already familiar with, baptizing? It wasn't something that originated with John or with Jesus. The word for baptize here is the Greek word baptizo, which means to wash or to clean. A baptism was a washing or a cleaning, and the Jewish people certainly knew a lot about that. Calling John John the Baptist or John the baptizer was functionally equivalent to saying he was John the cleaning guy. 
John the cleaning guy. Doesn't sound as official as John the Baptist. Now, as we move through Advent, our gospel reading today gives us another picture of the significance of the arrival of Jesus through the narrative of John the baptizer, John the cleaning guy. John was preaching in the wilderness. He was calling people to repentance, to turn away from their sinful ways, to change their thinking, to move in a new direction in their lives. As he offered, as he, and he offered people the opportunity for a baptism, a washing, a cleaning in the Jordan River as part of his call for repentance from sin. His message caused quite a stir. The voice of God through the prophets had been silent for hundreds of years to the Jewish people. Now, looking back at antiquity, it's easy to kind of minimize, oh, hundreds of years. It was longer than the United States has even been in existence. God had not spoken to his people through the prophets. And now John is in this remote place preaching with authority, the authority of God. So people flocked to him. In a time without social media, phones, and other communication devices that we are so used to, this message made it from the wilderness all the way to the heart of Jerusalem, to the Jewish leaders over 20 miles away. And what the Jewish leaders heard was so significant that they wanted an investigation. And they didn't just send a guy. They sent a whole cadre of people, priests and Levites, to find out what was going on with this guy, John the Baptizer. So they show up, these this cadre of people, priests and Levites, and they say, Who are you? John tells them that he is not the Christ, that he is not Elijah, and he is not the prophet. So I'm going to come back to this phrase in just a second, but just as an aside, I want to I want to clear something up about this uh, idea that John denies being Elijah. You might be confused when he says he's not Elijah, since Jesus is quoted in Matthew 11 saying that John is the Elijah who was to come. Now, the Bible talks about the spirit of Elijah, which was a prophetic role. When Elijah was taken to heaven in, in 2 Kings, a double portion of his spirit was given to his apprentice, Elisha. It is clear in the text that Elijah and Elisha are not the same person. They're two distinct people who are operating in the same role and with the same spiritual authority from God. So when John denies being Elijah, he is indicating that they are two distinct individuals. When Jesus says that John was the Elijah who was to come, he is saying that John was operating in the role of and the spirit of Elijah. Just wanted to clear that up. So back to the text. The priests and the Levites hear John deny that he's the Christ, that he's Elijah, or that he's the prophet. And they know that their bosses back in Jerusalem will not be satisfied by hearing about all the people who John isn't. They need to know who he is. Who are you, they say. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John responds, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. They insist, if you are not the Christ, Elijah, or the prophet, why are you baptizing? And this is where it gets interesting. At least it gets interesting for me. The priests and the Levites and the ones who sent them know all about being clean and unclean. Their whole culture is built around being ceremonially clean and staying that way. And they knew that there were specific practices laid out to become ceremonially clean. And now here's this hippie looking guy, John, in the wilderness doing his own cleaning in his own way. And yet he still spoke with authority. He called the people not to, he called the people to a deep rooted repentance, not because they were ceremonially unclean, not because they mixed the wrong kinds of fabric, not because they were eating the wrong kinds of food. He called the people to repent because they were spiritually unclean and no amount of ceremonial washing could address the spiritual rot and decay on the inside. That is a hard message to hear. I'm sure it was hard for the priests and the Levites, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. John is saying, you can follow the laws on cleanliness all you want, but you are still spiritually filthy. See, it probably wouldn't be so hard if they only needed to purify themselves due to a regulation of the the ceremonial law. But to to admit that the guilt goes much deeper, well, that might not be so easy. I think some of us feel that way sometimes. We are happy to acknowledge that we need ceremonial forgiveness for superficial issues. Oh, I didn't go to church this week or this month or or this year. Oh, I forgot to pray before a meal. Oh, I didn't do my morning devotions. I didn't put anything in the offering. Oh, man. I remember a a woman from my job a couple years ago. 
Uh, and she lightly said that she was going to be going to hell because she forgot to get ashes on her head on Ash Wednesday. Oh, darn. I guess I need some ceremonial forgiveness. Or maybe you're comfortable with the ceremonial sins of life. Oh, I was a little short with my family members. Oh, I wasn't 100% truthful on that application I filled out. Oh, I was a bit stubborn when I shouldn't have been. All superficial, right? And if the sins are superficial, maybe all we need is a ceremonial washing, a superficial forgiveness. John's message here may not sit so well. Full repentance. We recoil at the thought of our deeper sins being washed, the ones that make us actually feel guilty, because that would mean we'd have to admit them. When you go to a car wash, you often have the option of getting the basic wash, a quick exterior wipe down. Or you can get the supreme wash where they go inside and wash, vacuum, and cleanse the whole thing. Now imagine someone drove up to a car wash in a truck that looked decent on the outside and was a complete disaster on the inside. Imagine that person said, yeah, you know what, I'll just have the basic wash, please. Just wipe it down on the outside. How silly. What good is it to touch up the outside when the inside is filled with rotting food and garbage? Now, it might be silly in the sense of a car wash, but it is sometimes how we feel about ourselves. We would rather confess to the minor blemishes on the outside than admit the rot that takes place in our minds or the things we did in the past that we would never want anyone to find out about. We would rather make excuses than risk embarrassment or maybe because you don't want to risk judgment by other people or maybe judgment by God. John's message was a clear, was clear. His ministry was clear to the people then and a reminder for us now. You need a real cleaning. You need to be washed of all of your sins to your very core. And you can't do it for yourself. It needs to be done for you by someone else. John was modeling that for the people. They asked him, why do you baptize? John answers, I baptize with water but among you stands one you do not know. John is basically saying, my baptism is symbolic. It symbolizes the need for a real spiritual cleaning from our deep-seated sin. And in doing that, John is preparing the way for the one who would come with the power, the actual power to do the real cleaning, Jesus. The one that would arrive to take away the sins of the world, the filthy, disgusting sin that penetrates us all to our core. He came that we might be clean. One of my favorite kinds of videos that you come across on the internet is uh, parents walking in with their cameras uh, going, walking in on their kids who have gotten into a mess. Maybe it's a kid who's found their way into mommy's makeup cabin and it's painted their face with half of the mascara in the jar and the, and the lipstick is all over. Or a son who has decided that they would do some baking and then they turn the kitchen and their clothes and their face and everything into a complete disaster. Maybe you've seen video of kids who have tried to cut their own hair and their parents walk in right in the middle of it. The dialogue is always so, it's always so funny. Honey, um, what, what did you do? Oh, uh, I was, I was trying to, to make myself pretty. Um, honey, I think you made a really big mess. The kids usually have a guilty look on their face as they realize that they had made a big mistake and often they look kind of helpless. Now that, that's a bit how we might feel at the thought of God showing up. He caught us in a mess. We done screwed up and we're filthy. John pointed out that we were really dirty and needed to be clean. His symbolic cleaning through his water baptism prepared the world for Jesus to bring the real baptism, forgiveness of sins with power, all of them, all of the sins. He did not show up to point out our filth with a camera in our face, but to wash us, not to judge, but to pardon. Jesus arrived that he might take on the filth, carrying his cross, bloody, sweaty, and dirty, that we might be washed. He carried our shame, our regrets, the heavy weight of the very worst of us. He carried that on him as he hung on the cross, that we could be made clean again, whole again. And that is good news. John said, Among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. That one who stood there among them that they didn't know, he is with you. He is here now as well, Jesus. And because he washed us clean and welcomed us into his family, we do know him. And because of what he did for us, 
He has made us worthy, worthy to be counted as children of God, not rejected for what we have done, but cleaned and purified to our core because of what he did for us on our behalf. That is good, the good news of Advent. God himself showed up in Jesus to see us in our state of being dirty and offering us a true washing that we could be reconciled with God now and into eternity. Amen. I pray that the good news of God's cleaning ability to wash us of everything we've done just resonates with you this week as we prepare even more for the coming of Jesus. Amen.